a little bit of the farm DP finite horizon value equation that I mentioned already last time, but I'm just going to go through the algorithm once um, that you read many weeks back. I okay, started reading many weeks back uh, in the text and we just you know, went out of the test before getting back here. Um, and then that's the atomic level, and then we will shift gears and go to the factor representation for non-deterministic uh, conformant and conditional planning, for which you read the paper and wrote the reviews. I assume some of you did by the time I checked last night. I assume by the start. Okay. So that's what um, we are going to do. Okay. Any questions before I start? Okay. So, what the basic idea of, uh, first of all, you have to realize that what we're doing here is trying to find the optimal policy uh, for the finite horizon case. Uh, so that means from each uh, belief state, from each belief state, you need to figure out what is the optimal plan to execute. Okay. Given the belief state, you will have a plan for that belief state, which looks sort of like this. So you do an action A, uh, and then depending on the evidence, you then have conditional plans again. So these are like this again. So this would also be, this would also basically might look like this. B, E1, E2, E3, and then continue. Okay, um, the the number of the depth of this plan would be essentially equal to the horizon that you have. Okay, um, so when you have um, uh, so if you are trying to find the optimal plan for horizon k, the idea is to start from horizon zero, one, two, etc. Okay, at horizon one, you essentially consider just doing a single action. Okay. Horizon 2, you consider doing an action um, and follow based on the evidence doing another action. Okay. Um, so if you are at the horizon 1, the question then is, of all the plans you can do of size 1, which one is the best to do in your belief state? Now remember that belief state is a vector in the space of states. It's basically a probability vector in the space of states. Okay, so the basic idea that we'll do is uh, first we'll uh, so enumerate all plans of size k. Okay, in particular when you start, you are looking basically at all plans of size one. Okay. And all plans of size one would be doing just one action. So if you have uh, 25 actions in your domain, then you just consider doing each one of them as one plan. Okay, now given that, and then basically you have to evaluate those plans. And to evaluate those plans, you need to compute the value, the utility of that each plan in a given state. Okay, that is written as alpha p s in the textbook. Okay, so the alpha p s is the utility of uh, doing plan p, expected utility of doing plan p in state s. Okay, since you can basically have k, if your state space has, you know, um, thousand states, then you need alpha ps to be computed for each of the thousand states. So it will be a thousand dimensional vector. Now belief state also happens to be a thousand dimensional vector. Right? And the expected value of doing alpha p in a belief state is just the dot product of the belief state with alpha vector. Do you see what I'm saying? So for example, if you only have two states, S1 and S2, and I have a plan P, 
which will give me 7 if I do it from S1 and 9 and 10 if I do it from S2. And I have a belief, so then I have a vector 7, 10. And suppose I have a belief state um, and that basically is 0 0.9, 0 0.1. Right? Then my expected value of doing this plan in this belief state is 0 0.9 times 7 plus 0 0.1 times 10. Right? Okay, so, and then, so that's basically what you would see as the value of doing that plan in that belief state. Okay, now the question of course is, at each belief state, you will pick the plan that has the best utility. So if I have one plan, uh, which is 710 over S1, S2, okay, another plan, and so if I would, and I have this particular belief state, 0.9.1, and that would give me the dot product, the expected value would be 0.9 times 7 plus 0.1 times 10. That is 6.3 plus 1, 10.3. Right? Okay. Now, suppose I have a different plan, okay, um, another different plan, and that happens to be in S1 and S2 for that plan P2. So this is plan P1, and this is plan P2, and since we are, you know, for now, act as if we are just considering one size plan. That means plan P1 is doing action A, plan P2 is doing action B. Okay, um, then P2 will essentially, let's say, that has a valuation of 20 and 0.3. So in this same belief state, if you do this plan, the expected value will be 0.9 times 20 plus 0.3 times 0.1. And 0.1 times 0.3. Okay? Because 0.9 times 20 that plus 0.1 times 0.3. Okay? And that would be what? 18 plus 0 0.03. 18.03. Suppose these are the only two plans you have in this belief state. Which one would you pick? You will clearly pick the one which gives you the uh, higher value. Because it's a choice, it's a Markov decision process. It's a partially observable Markov decision process. So in each belief state, you're going to pick the plan that is most, um, that has the highest expected utility. Do you see what I'm saying? So. So that's, that's the basic idea that you want to understand. Okay. Having done this, then you have picked with horizon one what would be the best plan to pick in each belief state. Remember, belief states are continuous. So really what we would hope is for a whole region of belief space, you will pick one plan, another whole region, you will pick another plan, another whole region, you will pick another plan. Otherwise, you're dead. Because you're going to have to remember infinite number of you know, uh, combinations. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, now, having done that, if you did do that, then the next would be, can I, using dynamic programming, compute the best two horizon plan from each belief state, knowing the best one horizon plan from each belief state, which is basic dynamic programming. Did you see what I'm saying? Yes. So we can use dynamic programming for plans, but not the bounding functions themselves, right? So in order to determine the utility of a uh, of executing a plan in a belief state, we'll have to reevaluate that at every uh, step or at every case. I, I didn't get your question. All right. So the, there are there may be a finite number of plans or of actions that we can execute at one stage. Yeah, yeah. But there would be an infinite number of uh, belief states. So yes. we can't pre-calculate the value of each belief state. Uh, at that that's stage. so. That's why you basically for the finite horizon case we are essentially thinking in terms of plans rather than the values. And the infinite horizon case is actually, we won't even discuss it today. Okay. Um, okay. So, that's basically the background. Do people get that? Okay, then with respect to that, you know, that's what this is saying. Uh, you know, you will assume, you know, you enumerate all the plans of size k, 
and, uh, and then you compute their values from each of the states, and then you get a vector. And then for each belief state, you take the dot product of this vector with the belief state vector. You will know the expected value. And then you're supposed to take the max of these values. And what we'll see next is this, and as I said, you better be the case that um, for a whole region of belief state, one of these plans would be maximum. And that will happen. That's the piecewise linear part that you'll see next. Yes. Uh, sorry, we compute the value functions of the individual states using the standard MVP techniques. So we get those 7 and 10 values just by using what we did. Yeah, that's what you're seeing right now. We're going to show it in a minute. OK, so here is my example that I was mentioning last time. It's an extremely simple example where you can draw the pictures because you only have two states, OK, uh, 0 and 1. And if you are in state 0, you will get a reward of 0. State 1, you get a reward of 1. OK, since there are only two states, the belief state really is a 2 array vector. And furthermore, if you know just one number, you know the other number. OK, so you can almost think of belief state as a one-dimensional belief, one-dimensional um, entity. OK, uh, so and then uh, you only have two actions. This is as simple as it gets. You know, uh, the, you have only two actions. One action is stay, another action is go. If you try to do, if you do stay, then you stay in wherever state, whichever state you are in, and uh, with 0.9 probability, and you go to another, the other state with 0.1 probability. Okay. If you do go, then with 0.9 probability, uh, you go to the other state, and 0.1 probability you stay in this state. This is the model of the action, right? And you know, during planning, you only essentially think of just the, you know what would you predict, and then you consider what might be the observation, and then go forward with that. Okay, it's only during execution this issue of actual partial observability comes up. Okay, um, so and then sensor assume that it, you, 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 you can assume that sensor reports the correct state with 0.6 probability during execution. Okay. And then, you know, in this case, you're ignoring discount factor. So let's assume that basically you're in indefinite horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now in this case, if I'm starting from, um, you know, if I'm doing a finite horizon case, the last, the lowest horizon is one, which basically means just an one single action plan. How many single action plans are there here? There are only two plans. One is stay and one is go. Okay, so for each of them, I need to compute what is the value of doing stay in state one, what is the value of doing stay in state two. And similarly, what's the value of doing stay, you know, go in state one, what's the value of doing go in state two. Then I'll get the vector for both stay and go. Then I can take the dot product of them for every possible belief state to compute the you know, valuation of those plants, relative values of those plants with respect to each belief state. Those are all the steps we're going to do now. Okay. Um, so for the value of doing stay in state zero, this is just your Bellman equation. Okay. Which is R of zero plus you know gamma of course is one and 0.9 you stay in the same state so 0.9 R of zero plus 0.1 R of one um, and that would be 0.1. Okay. And similarly uh, for one. You can say that doing stay, if you happen to be in state 1, you'll get 1.9. Remember, I have to do this because I don't know which state I will be in. Okay. Similarly, go 0.9 and 1.1. So the vectors corresponding to stay is 0 0.1 and 1.9. Vector corresponding to uh, go is 0 0.9 and 1.1. Okay. Now, consider my belief state. Now, because this is just a two-dimensional, it's a two-state scenario, really I can think in terms of just the probability of being in one state, state one, and then that will give me the probability of being in state zero as one minus that. Okay, so in this x-axis, I'm considering probability of being in state one. This is zero, that means I'm actually in the, you know, with full probability, I'm in this 1.0 probability, I'm in state zero. And here, this has become 1, that means 1.0 uh, probability I'm in state 0. Okay? So every point here corresponds to one of your belief space states. Right? Okay. 
Now, I can then essentially, for each of these points, I need to compute the dot product. Remember that each of these points, like point two really is the point, point eight, point two. I'm sorry, the word point is being used many times. But this coordinate point two corresponds to the belief state point eight, point two. You see that, right? Okay, so now if I do the belief state point eight, point two, then I can, I can do what is the relative value of this and you know, what's the relative value of that. Okay, and take the best one. And conceptually, what you can actually also see is, since in fact it's, the, it's a dot product of a vector with the belief state vector, and the belief state vector is changing linearly from here to here. Okay, essentially for the uh, state plan, the belief state, for each belief state, the value would be like this. This line determines the value. Right? Because essentially the belief state would be 1 minus P, P. For each point P here, the belief state is 1 minus P, P. So all I'm doing is 1 minus P times 0.1 plus P times 1.9, that would be a straight line. And I just do that straight line there. Okay? And similarly, the other guy's straight line looks like this. Now at each point, actually, you are computing this number and this number conceptually. And you're taking the one higher, one whichever is bigger, which is equivalent to doing upper envelope of these lines. Upper envelope of these lines. That's why when we left last time, I was showing lots and lots of lines, and then we were trying to find the upper envelope. That's what we're doing. The reason we're doing it is essentially because we're doing the right thing. We're picking among the plans that I can do from the belief state, which one will give me the best value. And the valuation of each plan in the belief space would be a hyperplane. And so essentially, you will then wind up having to take the upper and lower of the hyperplanes. OK? And this will tell me, um, you know, so basically, this is my policy. If I have only horizon one, then my policy is from here to here, I'll always do this plan go. And from here to here, from here to here, I'll always do the policy, do, do the, uh, do the uh, plan state. And furthermore, if I only have horizon one, okay, that means I only have one action to do, this also defines the value function for these states. Right, because the value function is the value of the best plan. And the nice thing to notice is the value function is actually, I mean, one of the things that we notice here is the value function dips in the middle. In this case, it does, but actually, in this case, it doesn't look like it's dipping, but you know, um, it's convex, essentially. You can't see that it is dipping here because it's pretty much horizontal. But you'll see in the other pictures that it'll always dip. The reason that makes sense is something that I mentioned earlier, which is you will always do better by knowing which state you are in. You never get any advantage by having uncertainty about the state you are in. And in the middle, you always have uncertainty as to which state you are in. So you don't quite know who is the winner. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so this is one of the useful things to see that value function will always be uh, convex and piecewise linear. And it's the piecewise linearity of the value function that allows you to say that for a pieces of the belief space, you have one plan. This will make the policy finite sized. That means if you just need to remember the policy, you know, you don't need an infinitely large table to remember the policy. Do you see what I'm saying? Because even if, in fact, I only have 15 plans, if it turns out that for every, if every belief state, it's some random one from these 15 plans, then I need to remember the entire table. Because I need to know which is the best, best plan to do for that state. Instead, I'm saying for, the, for this whole region, the best plan would be this. For this other whole region, the best plan would be this. And the number of regions is finite. 
And as long as the number of regions are finite, policy is going to be fine. This is all for Horizon 1. OK? Now, now what I do is what I'm doing is I'm going to actually, now that I have Horizon 1, um, so I'm going to do the Horizon 2 based on, based off of Horizon 1. So for this particular problem, um, essentially, I have, when I have Horizon 2, remember I can, you know, I have a stay plan and I have a go plan. Okay, in the horizon, when I have two horizons, that means here I can have stay or go. Okay, two possibilities here. And then remember that, so my plan, the, what I'm thinking of is that after doing this, at the runtime, I will get a percept. The percept will either tell me I'm in you know S1 or in S2. I'm sorry, zero or one basically. That's the number that is. Right? And then based on that, I need to consider doing either stay or go here or go or stay. How many size two plants are there? Eight, nice exponential increase, right? You started with two plants, by second level you have eight plants, right? Because I can pick any of the number of actions A here, any of the number of actions A here, any of the number of actions A here. Okay, and you can only imagine how it will be when you go to size three and size four, and when you go to size eight, you know, is the one that I was talking about, it'll be 2 power 155 or something. Okay? But we'll see in a minute. Okay, so the point is the number of, conceptually it is simple enough because you're just comparing plans, except the number of plans just keeps increasing quite significantly from level to level. But let's go ahead for at least second hydration. Okay? In the case of second hydration, I will have eight plans of this type. The first plan would be do stay, and the one this plan let's say is do stay, and then you get either zero or one at the you know execution time, and then you decide upfront that if I were to get zero, I will do stay, and if I were to get one, I'll do stay. That's my plan here. And I can also do stay, go, stay. That means if I get zero, I'll do go. If I get one, I'll do stay. And I'm trying to decide between these eight plans that I can do which would be the best plan for each belief state. Okay, now the nice thing of course is this can be written recursively because I know the values of these from the belief state. Because from when you come here I have horizon one and I know the values. Okay, so in essence you're going to write the alpha, the, the value of this plan in terms of the values that you computed for the subplans. So the notation is this would be, if this is plan P, then this is P dot zero, this is P dot one. So this is the part of the plan when you get zero as the evidence, and this is the part of the plan when you get one as the evidence. And you would have, in the previous iteration, computed those vectors. Okay? And so, you can use that to compute the values of these eight plans in each of the two states. They will have exact values in each of the two states, um, numerical values, obviously. And now, you would basically, and they would correspond to a hyperplane if you apply them to the belief states. Do you see what I'm saying? Each plan corresponds, in, in each state, each plan has a value. So that means, in, you know, all the, all the eight plans are two-dimensional vectors. A belief state itself is a two-dimensional vector. At any given belief state, you get the value by multiplying the belief state by the um, alpha p vector. And that corresponds to essentially a hyperplane, or a, in this case, a line. And so in this case, this picture shows eight different lines. 
Okay. And what you need to, of course, do is to take the upper envelope of these eight different lines. Okay, so here the upper envelope is like this. Once again, it's finite. Because, you know, for this up to here, you do one plan. From here to here, you do a different plan. From here to here, you do a different plan. From here to here, you do a different plan. And each line corresponds to a plan. And if that line is winning in that region, then that's the plan that you're picking, in essence. Okay? That's basically what you're doing. Uh, now, the only other point, the only other point is that while you go from this iteration to the next iteration, do I need to keep, so look at these dotted lines. The real question is, do I need to keep those dotted line plants around or not? Mm. And the answer is that they are dominated here already. Okay, so there is no reason to take them next level. If you do take them to next level, you will use them in these, in these equations. And you would spend a lot of time computing a lot more dominated hyperplates, which will be dominated, and so you won't consider them. But you're just wasting your time. So it's like, you know, you're doing your algorithm, and after each step, you're doing a humongous amount of computation which will not change the final answer. So if you want to improve this, you know, algorithm without changing its correctness, then it would be great if you can prune these dominated hyperplates. That's a big point that the algorithm makes, and all the PalmDP algorithms talk about how to ensure, how to, you know, efficiently prune the dominated hyperplates. Okay. If you do that, then next iteration would not be as bad as, as bad as you know, we'll see in a minute how much time each iteration takes in the worst case. And that's like exponential. Okay, and so at least you can reduce the exponent. Okay, and then the last thing that there was this part. This one essentially is saying what would it look like for a eight horizon case. Okay, and that's, that's what it looks like in this case. I and mean, he's just telling you. And in fact, what you could do is implement this. Okay, and in a horizon case, if you do not do any, um, uh, any, any pruning, then you will be essentially juggling uh, 2 power 150 power, 2 power 155 plans. Because a horizon case means this is an 8D additional plan. And you have to consider every conditional plan that is of size 8. Okay? Uh, but if you, if you do cut it, then at least you can do this. So, you know, there's existential proof that uh, close to three years back when they wrote this textbook, they were able to complete an 8 horizon farm DP and were able to draw this picture. Right? <laughs> so, I'm sure we can still do it. Okay? So, that's basically the idea of farm DP, finite horizon farm DP value equation. Okay. Uh, as I said, if this is the only thing you can do with Palm DP and nothing better, then it's pretty depressing. That's why I started with the better news, which is you can do approximate reasoning. You can do finite look ahead Palm DP um, uh, policy computation. That does not give you optimality guarantees. But this one gives you optimality guarantees, but this is pretty darn hard to compute. Okay. Uh, this gives you the algorithm that you can go through in the textbook, etc. Um, and then this is kind of nice to see. Um, if you're talking about how much time you spend just per iteration, okay, uh, the number of alpha vectors needed in the teeth iteration is that much. Which basically takes the number of alpha vectors from the t minus 1th iteration and exponentiates it by the number of evidence. Right? That's exactly what happened. The number of evidences is 0 and 1. I added, you know, these. So, so there were, in the 0th iteration, there were two plans. So you got here, it was two um, evidences, that means 2 power 2, 4, multiplied by the number of actions at the top, which is why you got 8. Right? 8 times this. 
Okay. Um, and then time for computing each alpha vector. For each alpha vector, you need to compute its value from each of the states. And then take the dot. And that's just to compute the alpha vector. Okay, and for that you need to do that the Bellman equation. Okay, and that can be shown to be again quadratic in the number of states, number of real states, not the belief states. If it's belief states, you're dead anyway. Okay, and so for iteration the complexity is that. Just for iteration the complexity is you know the number of actions, number of evidences and uh, quadratic in the state and exponential in terms of evidences and the previous uh, iteration plans. And this is why it's better to keep the previous iteration plans down by, dominate, by removing the dominated ones. If you do that, the base here reduces, so you won't consider the dominated plans here. If in fact I set the algorithm, I set the example such that stay is always higher than go, let's say. In our problem, obviously, you know, stay is higher uh, in some area and go is higher in some area. So neither of them is dominating the other. If I set the problem such that stay is, like one of them is always higher than the other one, that means one guy's line is always higher than the other guy's line. Then, in a sense, after in the first iteration, I should have you know, removed one of those plants because they dominated. And so when I come to the second iteration, then I'll only have two plants here. Okay? Now, I mean, instead of having four, I actually, if I, I only have one plant, basically that's, that plant stay will have to come here as well as here. That reduces the number of plants. Yes? So does noise ever play a big enough factor that you shouldn't get rid of the other states? You mean the dominated ones? Right. There's no noise that we're talking about. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by noise here. Um, I mean, there is noise in the world, but then we have decided that all our probabilities are correct. Okay. Okay. So that's basically um, <coughs> optimal finite horizon um, solution. Okay. Is there any pointer where the calculation for second horizon is given? Because I've gone through that tutorial a number of times, and if I try to implement it, then uh, you know, actually I, I can give you. I mean, there's another textbook chapter that I can send you. Know, from a different, yeah, would be really uh, different place. I think it's in. Uh, in fact, one of the cute things is computing the second. I mean, it's a good point. Um, finding the second iterations value functions um, involves essentially dealing with the evidence first. And, uh, and it turns out, I mean, I'll, I'll send you the chapter and you can look at it. Um, there is actually a nonlinearity one phase, in one phase, but then by the second phase, which is the only thing we care about, it will become linear again. So it's actually, a, you know, if you have that question, it's a good question. I will send that, you know, um, to the people who want to understand. It is the case that at every iteration, the final value uh, alpha value, you know, the, the final hyperplanes will all be at planes. That means they are linear. That is true. Okay, uh, so there are like a million types of ideas to s improve PAMDP, uh, you know, value computation, PAMDP policy computation algorithms. Okay, um, one which actually in that in the chapter that I will send you, I'll probably just send a scan of it. It's basically from a robotics textbook um, where there's a reasonable, slightly longer description of this. Um, but uh, that basically uh, what they, they, they talk about, uh, had one idea called uh, a point-based value iteration, which essentially is sort of saying, I'm not going to wind up considering all possible belief states. I'll only consider up front, 25 belief states. That's it. And then find out what is the right thing to do for each of those 25. If you see what I'm saying? And the idea there, sort of the idea is that not all belief states are really equally likely. Starting from the initial belief state, given actions, uh, not all belief states are equally likely. And so, figuring out exactly what to do 
for every possible region of this hyperspace <laughs> is unnecessary if you never actually ask what am I supposed to do there during the execution. Okay, so these guys essentially approximate by just saying you will probably never want to know what you are supposed to do in certain areas of the belief space. So we'll just say what to do in 25 different points and then you figure out which, are, which is the one you are closest to and do the action for them. That obviously reduces the computation. But there are all sorts of issues. I mean, you know, you cannot guarantee upfront that this will be optimal. Okay, so this is a different kind of approximation than the kind of approximations we talked about last time, um, which is, uh, which are essentially uh, just look ahead based online decision making approximations. Okay? So yeah. in the last lecture you said that if we will start with a uniform distribution of probabilities, uh, we will end up in, uh, like, we will end up in a mess and it will be uh, very difficult to filter the probabilities in the coming next states, next horizons. So you said that the distribution should be uh, normal for that. No, 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 no. I, <laughs> no. What, what, what do you mean? So for example, if we take the 4 by 3 word, mm -hmm. the book, so in that the probability will be 1 by 9. Mm. So it's uniform. Mm. So you said that if the probability of each and everything is uniform, so uh, it will be very difficult to find a filter which will actually filter the. No, no, no. That, that's not what. What, what is what I was trying to say is you know in that particular in the grid example you are supposed to deal with uniform distribution as the first belief state. Okay. All I was saying is Kalman filtering corresponds to doing filtering over belief states that are normally distributed. If your original belief state is normally distributed, then after in, in Kalman filtering, every step of the way you will still have normally distributed belief states. I did not mean to say that you should have a normal distribution for that grid problem. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. Uh, and then this is the last part I'm going to say about uh, the atomic bomb DPs, which is that for infinite horizon problem, it's again further beyond the discussion that I have done here. Um, there are human, there, there is this I in the beginning of this set of lectures, I said I took these slides from a bomb DP tutorial by Eric Hansen and, and his colleagues, and uh, there are algorithms for you know infinite horizon and DPs. Um, but essentially, uh, the problem itself is undecidable. We mentioned that in the beginning. Okay, just because it's undecidable doesn't mean that um, you cannot have, uh, you cannot solve it for small sizes. Okay, so in general, the problem is value inflation. Um, the value function may not be piecewise linear for an infinite horizon quantity, and if it's not piecewise linear, then then you're dead, basically, because you need infinite space to just represent the policy. But there are enough practically occurring problems which have special structure that they do wind up being piecewise linear, which is theoretically very interesting. So the people who actually showed that have gotten a lot of you know good reputation by that point. Because showing that, you know, for certain classes of problems, infinite horizon value function is still piecewise linear. It's not obvious at all. Okay. Um, so, but then you know, in those cases, essentially, you can still apply these kinds of algorithms, and then hope that between two iterations, it doesn't change. Okay. Um, that's the only thing I can say about infinite horizon function. Okay. Now notice that finite horizon pump DP is essentially is what we were approximating with finite look ahead anyway. So this is the so the all the discussion that we did before this section, this slide was optimal, I mean so probably optimal way of doing finite look ahead. Okay. And I looked up I talked about the approximate version last week. Okay, so I'm going to move on from the atomic uh, representations uh, for bomb DPs um, and then go to factored representations. Except I'll only talk 
about the stuff that you read in the paper, which is basically for the non-deterministic case. Okay. Um, and um, so the interesting thing is basically I want to talk about if you are aware of the state space, state variable representation for state spaces. Right. So first, I mean, for this part of the lecture, I assume that you know um, the strips action representation, which very quickly a, a state is basically you have a set of uh, state variables. You know, we can assume that they are Boolean, V1 to Vn. Up front, we can assume they are all Boolean. Okay? Um, so, a completely specified state will give you the truth falsity values for each of these n state variables. Okay? So, that means if you have n variables, then in a sense, uh, so I specify the state not by giving it a number, S57, but just by saying in this state, v1 is true, v2 is false, v3 is true, v4 is false, etc. And, uh, and so then obviously there basically this is a logarithmic representation because it compactly represents 2 power n states. And then we need to talk about actions. And for actions we use the strips representation, which basically we will say an action A will be applicable um, in a state if certain variables have certain valuations. And if it is applicable, then it will change the valuations of certain variables. Just talk to them. And remember that whole discussion I made um, two classes or one class back about how in the belief space representation, it doesn't make sense to have uh, actions with executability preconditions. Because if you have a set of states, there you have a set of 1,000 states, and this action is applicable in 999 of them, and in one of them, its precondition is not actually satisfied. Then if I ask what happens if I apply this action to this belief state, the answer is undefined. Because it's undefined for one state, so it's undefined for the whole thing. That makes not too much sense. So I said the way to deal with that is to assume that there are no preconditions, empty set of preconditions, and let's assume that all the effects are conditional effects. So I can say if, if I do an action A, then if V1 is true, then I will make V2 true. And if V1, I mean if V2, and if V4 and V5 are true, then I will make V6 false. I can do that too. Okay, basically the preconditions are just sort of trans put into the uh, FX list in some sense. So this action is always applicable. If any of these effects are, so for each effect you actually check, okay, is the antecedent applicable? If so, the you do the doctrine required by the consequence. And similarly, if V4 and V5 are true, then I will go ahead and make V6 false. That's how I compute the new state. Okay? Up to this, this is just the repetition of what strips actions do. Okay? So I'll represent actions this way. Now the question is, if I'm trying to use the same kind of, if I'm trying to use these actions with um, belief states, where a belief state now is a set of states, right? The belief state is a set of states. The interesting thing is, so in the normal planning problems, the, in, the, in the deterministic planning problems, I would give the initial state by giving the valuations for all the, initial, the variables. And my goal state, I would say, all I care is V7 equal to true. That means I just want V7. When I do that, how many states of the world satisfy this? If, for example, n equal to 10, how many states of the world satisfy my goal? 2 power 9. Right? So, in strips 2, we actually, in the strip planning, we assume that the initial state is just a conjunction, a complete conjunction over the... So, if you think of state variables as propositions, then initial state is a complete conjunction. 
where is that conjunction every variable takes part. And the goal state is just, it's not a complete conjunction. It can actually be an arbitrary Boolean formula. So for example, I could have said either V7 is true or V15 is true. I'm sorry, 15 cannot be there, I just said 10. So V7 is true or V10 is true. How many states are satisfying that? Two to the power nine. So basically, you know, you need to have either this or this, and so you double count the one where both are true, so you just cut down. Basically, you know how to compute the number of states with V7 and V10. Okay, so the point is, in strips representation itself, arbitrary um, propositional formulas correspond to set of states. A complete conjunction corresponds to a complete state, completely specified state. Now, I actually have, uh, so in the, in the deterministic planning, there was this asymmetry that initial state was always completely specified, goal state is only partially specified. And that was supposed to be a feature, not a bug. <laughs> right? Saying, uh, all I care about is V7 to be true means you can make everything else whatever you feel like. As long as you get V7 true, I'm happy. Telling you, all I know is that in the initial state V7 is true, on the other hand is a bug. Because that means I have no clue what happened to the rest of the variables. They can be either true or false. Okay, uh, in the strips representation, we assume that the initial state is complete conjunction, in the final state is a arbitrary Boolean formula. In fact, we normally assume them as be partial conjunctions. Now, when we get to belief space, Beliefs, a belief state is a set of states. So essentially, it's a disjunction over complete conjunctions. If I have disjunction over arbitrary a finite number of complete conjunctions, that corresponds to a particular Boolean formula. Okay? So all I need to do to actually um, generalize progression and regression algorithms which are used in deterministic planning. And all of this, I'm assuming you looked at the paper, so you know some of this. We didn't talk about classical planning here. I did talk about it in 471. But, you know, in the paper, you would have probably you know, looked at the regression and progression. Um, so the idea of progression would be you apply the action to the state, you get the next state, you apply the, another action to the next state, you get another state, until you reach a state where the goals are satisfied, and you start. Regression means you go backward. Okay, and if you have belief states, then you are applying an action to a, a Boolean formula, essentially. And you'll get another Boolean formula. And you keep doing this until your Boolean formula entails the goal state. Entails the goal formula. Because goal was always a formula. Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a propositional formula. It's not a complete conjunction. Okay. Um, so that's the point to understand that you can actually do uh, entire video space planning at the factored level. All you will wind up having to deal with is, you know, dealing with uh, logical formulas as against complete conjunctions. Now this seems very reasonable. It's not a huge deal, but it turns out it has its own interesting issues. So let's go forward on this. So you have complete states. And then if a belief state is a disjunction over complete states, and so in fact you can oftentimes you can actually you know simplify that and you'll find out what the you know, Boolean formula is. There's a compact way of representing a huge conjunction. So for example, if I have a, a, all I know in a 10 state variable, 10 state variable world, if I all I know is that uh, P50 I mean, P7 is true or nothing else. P7 is true and nothing else. If you write it as a conjunctive formula, you will essentially write 512 conjunctions. But they are syntactic, they are logically equivalent to just the logical formula P. I mean, logical formula, whatever I said is P7. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so I like to do is I just write P7 rather than write 512 complete conjunctions because it makes no sense. Okay. Um, so that's basically the representation of logical formulas. And so one question that arises in this, in this context is, 
Um, if I, one of the things that you know all these panels do is if you reach the same state in two different paths, then you should be able to see that you have reached this state. We want to do duplicate elimination. Now, if you're doing planning over belief states, you would be asking the question of, have I seen this logical formula before? That means, is this logical formula equivalent to some other logical formula that I have seen before? Unfortunately, checking equivalence of logical formulas is not at all true. Because I just showed you that you can write a 512 conjunction or just P7, and they're equivalent. What if one time you saw the 512 conjunction, other time you saw P7? Would you have realized that they're the same? You can, basically you need to do, you know, inference to actually say the equivalent. Okay, so one idea that helps in, 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 the, in this case is if there is a um, unique representation for each logical formula. If we agree on a unique representation for each logical formula, then if I see this logical formula again, it would be in the same exact form, so I should be able to just do order one comparison. Okay, now before we got along, got along here, we did know, um, okay, let's see. <coughs> we'll come back to this in a minute. This stuff is actually in the paper, but um, yeah, so effective representations for logical formulas, so we need to be able to convert belief states to canonical representation. We know two canonical representations. It means you should have heard about CNF, representing conjunctive normal form and disjunctive normal form. They are of the form that any logical formula can be converted to a CNF or a DNF. That's good part. But it's not guaranteed that given a CNF formula, which is a set of clauses, another CNF formula, which is another set of clauses, you know, they can, the orders can be different. And you still need to spend time checking whether they're equal. There is one more idea, which is basically a simplified version of an idea we've already seen, which is the decision diagrams. Okay, there is this idea called uh, reduced ordered binary decision diagrams which is um, this picture. So for example, if I have this formula, P implies Q and P implies S, that's my formula. Okay, notice where we went from where. So we started from um, you know, atomic models to factored models. And when you do factored models, you need representation for belief states. Belief states would be conjunctions over states, and basically the sets of states. Each set is a complete conjunction. So this disjunction of over these conjunctions would be an arbitrary logical formula. And we need an effective representation for this logical formula. And just as we talked about uh, you know, decision diagram representation for MDPs you know, several classes back, we are now going to talk about binary decision diagram representation for logical formulas. In some sense, actually, it's an easier idea than the other one. Because in the binary decision diagrams, the leaf nodes will always be 0 or 1. Okay, a decision diagram on the other hand, the leaf nodes can be any arbitrary numerical value. Decision diagram can be used to represent a value function. Whereas the binary decision diagram is going to represent only a Boolean function, where the function can have only value zero and one. Okay, however, you're just coming to it from a slightly different angle, okay? And, um, and in fact, the BDDs have very rich um, history um, and uh, they are used a lot in circuit verification. Because when you're doing Boolean circuit verification, that's again this issue of, you, you know, when you're doing Boolean circuit verification, you're asking, okay, the initial state of the circuit is some set of states. When you switch it on, it's in some set of possible states. And then you do various operations, it'll go from some sets of states to other sets of states to other sets of states. My question is, will I ever reach a bad state this way? Or can I guarantee that any set of state that I transit, any state I transition through is probably going to be a good state? This requires reasoning over huge numbers of states. So they had similar problems as us. Okay, and so they developed, in fact, um, this idea called uh, uh, binary decision diagrams and reduced order binary decision diagrams. 
And so here, you know, you have a logical formula here. CNF it look like this. DNF it look like this. And this is the BDD representation. Okay, it's a Venetian diagram representation. Now the interesting thing is, I'm not expecting that you will figure out everything about binary dash diagrams just from this lecture. I'm hoping that you will know that these things exist, and that you know, if you want ever to uh, have to use efficient representations for Boolean formulas, as we had to do here, you can go to that. Okay. Um, BDD is basically, uh, and then the, the one additional aspect of BDD is uh, ordered binary notation diagrams, where you introduce an order over the variables, and you will introduce them into the tree only in that order. And then there is a reducing operation, so you remove some, of, you do some obvious simplifications, and if you do that, then you will get for any given formula, if you use the same variable order, if you have two different logical formulas that are equivalent, and you took time to convert them into VEDs, they'll be exactly the same way. Okay, so you just amortized your work. You know, you did, you know, by actually ensuring that you follow some rules, you ensure that the representation is unique, and so if you ever see the same state again, you will actually be able to see it because uh, it would be the exact same VED. There is no inference required. That's an advantage of BDD representation. Okay, um, so here are some pictures. Uh, this is actually, these are, no, this is fine. So th these basically show, so here is a, a reasonably large sized uh, uh, logical formula. Okay, and it turns out these two are both BDDs for it, but they correspond to different variable orders. But if you pick one variable order and stick to it, then you'll only get one BDD. It turns out that depending on the variable order, a logical formula might have a much larger BDD or a much smaller BDD, which might make you ask, can I know which order should I use? The answer is yes, but it'll be costly to find out what the right order is. Okay. Essentially, finding the right order, what is the, opti what is the optimal order of variables to make the BDD size smallest for a given formula is NP-complete. <laughs> right? so, so there is no way of winning. So mostly what people will do is they'll just pick one order and stick to it. So they'll win some, they'll lose some. Okay. Um, so in this case, of course, you know, hope that you pick this order and then we'll always stick to it. So in this case, we win. But in some other, some other formula, you might become larger because there would have been a smaller, you know, BD with different representation. Okay. Um, now, so this part, by the way, is from Randy Bryant's slides. Randy Bryant is a uh, computer uh, circuit verification guy, and he got a Turing Award for this work. Okay. So we're essentially coming to this from a different direction. But this stuff is very useful in multiple, you know, it's, it's a great tool, you know. We wound up using it, in this case, for belief state representation. Okay. Uh, so, again, remember the idea is using BDDs to do a task faster essentially involves doing all the operations of the task as BDD operations. So that you never get out of BDDs. Remember we talked about this for the value function too. Okay, you want to be able to reinvent um, Bellman update as a decision diagram operation. Given a value function corresponding to the previous value function as a decision diagram. Okay, reward function as a decision diagram. And the action as a binary, um, as, as a dynamic base network. I should up directly give you, you know, a way of computing the decision diagram for the next value function. You know, another idea would be to just take that whole thing, make it into a tabular representation for the value function, compute the new value function using your idea, and then make it into a BDD, I mean, make it into a decision diagram. That won't, that won't impress anybody, right? Because you wasted all your time in doing all the reasoning at the atomic level. So the trick of using these kinds of representations is that you need to reinvent. So you basically have to 
reinterpret the operations directly as the data structure operations, the VD operations. And the papers I gave you at the time of decision diagrams told you how to do it for decision diagrams, for the Bellman equation for decision diagrams. And there actually, that stuff is actually more general than this, and that takes off from this, okay? Because binary decision diagrams are a more special case where the function has only zeros and ones, and there are a lot more interesting simplifications, etc., that can be done for VDs that can't be done for normal decision diagrams, ADDs. Okay, but anyway, so all this guy is saying is if you want to use my you know, BDDs, represent the data as a set of uh, OBDDs, ordered binary decision diagrams, express the solution method itself as a set of symbolic operations on the binary decision diagrams, okay, um, and then implement operations as BD uh, operations, and there are you know, libraries out there because this stuff is important enough for Intel and uh, Motorola and every other uh, you know, circuit verification company, uh, there are you know, packages out there for doing efficient binary decision diagram uh, manipulations. So you can essentially then you know, call those operations. As long as you can write your method in terms of the BDD operations, you are, you are you know, in run. Okay. Um, and this is basically what I just said. Arguments of OBDDs, basically each operation takes OBDDs and gives out OBDDs. And OBDDs are unique for the same uh, art variable order. Okay? And each OBDD step is polynomial in the size of OBDD. And I did say that a OBDD itself may become exponential in the size of the, the canonical logical formula representation. Right, for example, that's what users saw. I mean, this looks much more compact than this, <laughs> right? So it can be much larger. But then you don't need to fall now here, here. Okay. Now hope is that this is not as big an exponent on the size of the formula here as you would have, as what I would have gotten if I went from here to the set of all complete states that corresponds to that logical formula. By the way, those of you who remember, you know, uh, the discussion on logic from any course, either 471 or you know some other course, um, a, basically a model of a logical formula is a state because a model is the, the exact truth falsity assignments or all state variables such that under that interpretation, the logical formula evaluates to true. So the set of states corresponding to a logical formula are just its models. So what we're doing is just computing the models. So clearly, doing you know doing all the models and then reasoning at the model level is what we were doing at the atomic level. This would be somewhere in between, and to that extent, it can be more efficient. And we do know that going at the model level, operations are uh, polynomial, at least for MDPs and uh, for the belief state operations. The sad part of PalmDP is. Even at the complete state level, the operations are exponential. Iteration complexity. Okay, so that's the thing. Uh, and then uh, I'll just show these are again basically to give you an idea of the, you know, the way the BDDs get manipulated. Uh, to actually do this, you need to know a lot more about the data structure itself. Okay. Um, so here, so I have a planning problem. So a state would be represented. Um, you know, this is the planning problems uh, state representation. So if they say, you know, here's one state, is another state, and I want to get to this state, and there is some state transitions, you know, between the states. And, uh, and each state essentially is a uh, uh, complete specification of truth falsity values over state variables. In this particular case, those are the state variables. Okay? Uh, my, and then a set of states would be, so these are three different states, a set of states would be disjunction over those. Yeah, except we will just implicitly represent them as a BDD. Because the set of states correspond to some logical formula, they just get represented as BDD. Okay? And uh, then one of the other interesting things that's kind of cute is what about the transition functions? There is an action which says it will take you from one to two. Right? So that action, can, that part of the going from one to two could be represented this way. 
essentially locked, not bad position and not loaded, will get you to this is the these are these are called the prime notation. Prime notation is the variables at the next step. The same variables at the next step. Okay? According to this transition, if you start from here, you will get this. Okay? So that's one transition. This is another transition. The entire transition function is a conjunction of all these transitions. Yes, you know, right? No, I'm sorry, it's a disjection of all transitions because any one of these transitions get that. And some, that's a logical formula. It's just a logical formula on a set of variables that's double the size of the original set of variables. We have the time t variables and time t plus one variables. Okay? Um, and so you will get a representation for the BTD for the transition function itself. And in essence, progression is starting from a belief state, applying the transition function to get the next belief state. So I have a BDD, another BDD, do some operation, I'll get the new BDD. It corresponds to one step transition of this belief state over the entire transition function. That's what is the advantage of doing factored reason. Okay? Um, and so they do that part. Okay, so they do that part using uh, BDD representations. Okay, so for example, in this case, this is a single state 3 as a BDD. This is the set of three states 1, 3, 5 as a BDD. Because the disjunction over those three conjunctions. And this BDD will only get true if in fact you are in one of those three states and false otherwise. That's all you get. And this is a BDD that tells you that if you are in 4, you will stay in 4. If you are in 4, you will get to 3. Okay, that's two different transitions. And this is the BDD corresponding to that. So here is a belief state BDD, here is a transition BDD, and you do an operation um, of projecting, the, the idea of projecting this state through a transition function can be, can be written as a BDD operation. Okay? Um, and that's basically how you do reasoning um, using BDD at the belief state. Okay. Um, the other things that I want to mention, which you actually read already, but I can go through it quickly, is if I don't care about this whole business of the cost of computing the duplicate sets, and you know I don't want to use the BDD representation, then I can just go with either CNF or DNF representation. Okay. And the paper you read essentially did, you know, the examples in the first sections were on. You know, CNF and DNF representations. Okay. Um, so, so if you are doing, let's say, um, the progression, it turns out that the DNF representation is a more natural representation because in DNF you have a disjunction over conjunctions. Each conjunction can be thought of as like a mini state. And progression can be directly, if you know, if you understand how strips progression works, you can apply that directly to the DNF representation. Okay, so for example, if I have this belief state, and I have the action A3, uh, which says if R true, then I'll give L. And, you know, I, in this case, I went ahead and put a precondition anyway, even though I said it's not useful to have preconditions. And I put a precondition and said, only if M is true can you even do this action A. And thankfully for me, M is true in each of the uh, conjuncts of the DNF. Okay? And so where R is true, you would put an L also. Okay? So this one R is not true, this one R is not true, so they come back as they are. This one R is true, I would keep not only R, but I also throw in an L. That's my CNF, that's my DNF for the next step. Okay, and then I do this action which says A5, if you are L true, then I'll give you G. So when I apply that there, then this remains the same, this remains the same, this will have L and G. 
Now suppose if G is my goal state, that means all I want to do is reach a state where G is true. Am I currently in a belief state where G is true? No. No, because, because if I happen to be in one of the states that corresponds to this content, then G will be true. What if I happen to be in one of these two? G is still not true. So this is a weak plan for making G true. And I can say G is for sure true if there is a G for each of these. You see what I'm saying? Another way of saying it is, logically I can stop if this formula, which is this, this DNF formula, entails G. So you can call your favorite theorem prover and ask, is G true? And if it says yes, you're done. If not, you're done. And no theorem prover would say G is true. Yes? Uh, why didn't you put that L in the middle state for... This one? No, no, in the middle state. Why you did put L in the, the last formula? Not in the yeah, because second. if R is true, L is true. I, I wrote capital R by mistake, but I meant small r. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I meant small r. I'm case insensitive. So I'm using DOS operating system. So uh, that's what I meant. So that's why I put L. Okay. I want to tell you one more thing and we can basically stop. Let's do the same exact, so, so problem we solved here essentially is this problem. I have the following actions and initial state M is true and exactly one of three Q and R are true. That's the initial state. And the goal state I want G. And I showed you a partial plan for making G, okay? Now the plan that I actually showed you, there are no sensing actions, so it's a conformant plan. So if I were to reach a belief state where G is entailed, then I get to stop and say, you do these actions in sequence, you will be done. Now, from planning perspective, when you are here, you could have considered this action or some other action or some other action. Which of the actions would you consider to expand? That's a heuristic issue. Which one would lead you more likely to the goal state? And the paper you read, the rest of the paper that you didn't deal with, essentially talks about uh, that question. You know, how do you decide which state, uh, which child state is more promising? In the sense it's likely to actually go towards, you know, a goal state, goal belief state. Okay, uh, but this is, this whole thing is right now, in this example we went in the progression direction. Okay, the regression thing, you can do the same problem in the regression direction and, you know, it's kind of useful to think about what regression does. Okay. So in the case of regression, I start from G, and I argue, suppose A4 is the last action, A4 is the last action, so that can be a last action because I need G and A4 will give me G, but if A4 were to give G, it requires K to be true before, right? In the normal regression planning, you would have put A4 and you would have written just K here. Notice that I wrote G or K. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> There's nothing strictly wrong because, you know, if G or K, if K is true, G or K is still true. But if I just wrote K, the problem is I would never know. I could have an initial state which is disjunctive. So when I go down, I need to, I need to be able to know in, in the normal classical planning, when I went down in the regressions, it ends when it reaches the initial state. In the initial state, I would know every variable's value. But now I am in belief space. So the initial state may actually be incomplete. It might just say P or Q. And if in fact I will reach a place where P or Q is true, and my initial state says P or Q, and somewhere along the line, I did not keep the disjunction, and so it became P separate or Q separate, then I won't say that this is a plan, because I only have P or Q, and I, am, I require Q. Okay, so to avoid that problem, I would have to, the only interesting thing that you have to do for the equation is you put the disjunction. So you would say A4 
will give G um, if you have a disjunction of what it is giving or its three conditions. That's the only difference. And then you have regression algorithm. Okay? So now you continue, you get A5. So A5 will give L implies G. Okay? So when I apply A5, then this G, I can get G by if I R, you know, G or L. But G or L. By the way, making G to be G or L is progress. Making G to be G and L is not progress. Did, did you get what I just said? Okay. Because now you have a way of getting G by just making K true here. And you get you can G true by just making L true here. So one of the nice things here, by this time, if I just have K or L true, then I would be done. Okay? So anyway, now I come here, and then uh, A1 basically would give me K. So I can put A1, and then for, for giving K, it requires a P. And then for the A1 to even be applicable, it requires M to be the precondition. So I have a precondition for it. Okay? So that would be the stage here, and then you do, and you continue. And the interesting thing is, by the time you come here, you will wind up having P or Q or R. In the initial state, only that is known. Either P or Q or R is true. You don't know which one is true. And this is a conformant plan, and so it basically said, if you do these actions, starting from here, you will reach goal, no matter what. Okay? That's basically how regression changes. Okay? I hope that will give you some idea of what is needed to be done to do these operations at the uh, factor level. Okay? Um, if you are much more interested in more details, then you can get a paper. Um, I am, with 99% probability, we are going to shift completely away from Markov foundation processes starting next class. You know, unless I feel like some desperate need to at least do some more. Mostly, <laughs> we will be shifting away from Markov foundation processes. Most likely, we started doing either constraint satisfaction or, or graphical probabilistic models.